Okay, Valeria, whenever you are ready. Okay, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, we're starting a new Topus Colloquium today and we, have, we are very happy to welcome Professor Martin Scardo. I'm saying it as a Brazilian because he's also Brazilian, but you can call him Martin Scardo if, or something like that, if you prefer. Martin is a professor at the University of Birmingham, UK. And, um, and he is very famous for, for lots of work, but in particular with respect to the uh, homotopy type theory and the book and, and, and things like that. But one of the things that, um, one of the reasons why I, I kind of thought would be very good to have Martin with us is because I think that um, the, 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 the things that we in the Topos Institute deal with are kind of very much connected to this collection of areas. So, you know, it's, it's type theory, it's constructive mathematics, it's formalization of mathematics, uh, and it's AI and it's language. And, um, and, and Martin is another person who kind of can deal with this collection of, of different um, foundations, kind of. So take it away, Martin. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Valeria, for the nice uh, introduction. And also thanks for having invited me. It's nice to be here. Well, here virtually. So, um, so I'm going to work uh, in univalent mathematics or homotopy type theory. And uh, I'm going to define a notion of compact, totally separated type. And then I want to also study some theorems about them proved in univalent mathematics. Um, and also want to look at what happens in some models, in particular in models like the topological topos, which I'm going to briefly recall um, as I give the talk. So now uh, I don't know why the page is not turning. <laughs> What happened? It was working a minute ago. Let's see if I'm going to try to make this bigger again. It always happens. <laughs> yeah, okay. Let's see if the page turns now. It's not turning. I have no idea. Why could this be happening? I don't know. Okay, so here we go. Okay. So this is uh, the problem we're going to study here, and it's going to have uh, three interpretations that I'm going to discuss in a moment, computational, logical, and topological. So the problem is very simple to explain. So I have a set or a, or a type, but actually, um, as you will see, this type will end up being a set nevertheless. And we have a Boolean valued function. So we have a function uh, into, the, into, the, into one plus one, and what you have to do is to either exhibit a root of this function or determine that there is no root, okay? And the question that I'm going to investigate here is for which sets this can be done. Now, um, computationally, this, this is just exhaustive search. So you have a set and then you have a, a Boolean valued predicate that you can test. And so, for example, if the set is finite, you just can scan this one element at a time and do it. But uh, computationally, one question is, can we do this for infinite sets mechanically? Valeria, can we see the pointer moving or not? My pointer. Yes, Martin, I can see the okay. pointer moving, thank you. Okay, so that's uh, computationally, that's an exhaustive search problem. Um, but in terms of logic, this is, a, this is a related to the axiom of choice. In fact, you can do this, uh, you can solve this problem for all types if and only if the axiom of global choice holds. I'm going to discuss this a little bit more later. But uh, interestingly, uh, in terms of topology, this turns out to be a compactness problem. So we'll see we can do this only when X is is a compact uh, space when we look at topological interpretations of the theory. Um, so what I want to do in this talk is to, well, firstly, um, investigate in the type theory independently of any models, uh, which types can, can be proved to have this property. 
but also I want I want to use the um, the topological topos as a motivation of a lot of definitions that I'm going to have so that uh, you can understand uh, why I'm doing some definitions in the way I'm doing and um, uh, and why some things cannot be proved. So I'm going to work with a type theory which has a, um, an empty type, a type with one element, the natural numbers, uh, co-products, binary products, some spy identity types and universe. And we, in this talk, I'm going to, to only use inductive definition, so W types, but uh, in the work that I actually have done, sometimes the, there are interesting results uh, constructing universes of, of these um, types that satisfy this property, which are inductively recursively defined. But unfortunately, I'm not going to have time to talk about this. We're going to have univalence. And um, um, so interestingly, so for the, for the property I'm looking at, um, okay. univalence, okay. yes. Sorry, there is a question on, on, on the chat. I wanted, I wanted to just, it's, I want to check whether you want to be told about things in the chat or not. So Seth is asking in terms of topology, what topology has to if, if you want to. Um, we're going to come back to this in, in very shortly in the, in the next slides. Thank you. So, um, so univalence is not really needed for, for looking at uh, this type satisfying this property, but actually I'm going to measure the complexity of these types and I'm going to use ordinals to measure the complexity of these types. And then univalence uh, is needed to actually deal with the ordinals. And I'm also going to assume uh, only one higher inductive type, which is quotients. And this is equivalent to propositional truncations and set replacement. And usually it is uh, these two conditions that I use and not the quotient directly. So there are many models, as you know. So one of them is sets, then there are spaces, and then there's model of homotopy types, uh, which motivates uh, homotopy type theory. And then, but also the realizability models and, um, and any topos, and in fact, any infinity topos can be made into model after results of uh, Mike Schulman and others. So here is um, a particular model that I'm going to be using in the talk to, I'm going to use it as a, as a guiding model. And um, so the site of the topos is you take the, um, the one point compactification of the discrete natural numbers, and then you consider all the continuous maps to itself. And uh, now you take the canonical topology on this, um, on this site, and this is the definition of the topological topos. And the, this topological topos uh, is stratified as follows. Well, it has a full subcategory, which is uh, equivalent to the category of sequential topological spaces. And this, this, uh, this subcategory is Cartesian closed. And uh, so by Cartesian closed, and also has a natural numbers object. If you go outside sequential topological spaces, so you look at the concrete sheaves in some terminology that some people use, then you get uh, the Kuratowski limit spaces. And now when you go to this uh, bigger bubble, then you get a locally Cartesian closed category. And so you can interpret um, um, dependent types. And, um, and then, um, well, in the whole topos, you also have things outside that. So like the sub-object classifier and uh, existential and universal quantifiers and more things. So in order to understand a little bit of um, this model, so let's look at what happens when we look at particular expressions in our type theory. So if you look at the natural numbers or, or two, and this answers the question that I was asked in the chat, they get the discrete topology. So you get uh, discrete topological spaces. On the other hand, if you, if you take the functions from n to the booleans or then to the natural numbers and you get the Cantor space or the bare space. So there are two ways of looking at that. So you just take uh, the, 
product of countably many copies of two with a discrete topology. So that's the Cantor space and similarly for the bare space. Or you can think in terms of the compact open topology and you get the same thing. So another interesting example, which is related to the, the Cantor space. So you look at the subtype of the Cantor space. So you look at the type of all binary sequences alpha, which are decreasing. And now when you look at, uh, at what space you get in the topological space, uh, sorry, in the topological topos, um, what you get is the one point compactification of the discrete natural numbers. So this, this sorry, object- Martin, Just to be clear, yeah. that n there is a natural numbers. If these are infinite sequences under the- yeah, so this, yeah, these are the infinite sequences. Um, Maybe you were missing this bar. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and uh, so essentially what is happening, um, this is going to be a, a, a sub-object of the Cantor space of the decreasing sequences. And in particular, you have the infinite sequences of ones. I call this a point at infinity. And then the number N is coded as the sequence of finitely many ones and infinitely many zeros. And uh, you can see in the Cantor space, the limit of these uh, sequences, the finite with finitely many ones is the, is the sequence with infinitely many ones. And this is why you get the one point compactification. And you have an embedding. Um, and this space also is going to be useful for us when we study topo, uh, um, the notion of total separatedness. So now you look at the subs, type of, uh, of the one point compactification. And uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to explode the point at infinity in two, into two copies. So, because this is a type, well, in particular, I mean, it have, as, as it so happens, this type has at most one element. And when, and when, um, when X is infinity, it will have exactly one element. So you will get a copy of an infinity, but with a point at infinity, we'll have two copies, depending on which function you take here when x is infinity. Now this space is, um, is a typical example uh, uh, in, uh, in books in topology as a counter example of, um, um, of the Hausdorff separation axiom. So, and other things. So this is space is T1, but not T2. So, and if you look at the numbers from zero to infinity zero, so this one, this is a compact set. And uh, also if you take infinity one, this is also a compact set. Um, but uh, when you intersect these two compact sets, you get the natural numbers, which is not compact. And this is why the space cannot be Hausdorff. So you cannot right. separate, you cannot separate these points by these joint neighborhoods. Is there a question? Yeah, I have another question. Can you parse the, I, I'm seeing, I think I'm seeing the identity type X equals infinity and I think I'm seeing an arrow type and I don't know the associative T there. Uh, where? It, in that parenthetical, you just were, can you break down what we're seeing there? This one? Yep. Um, here there is a bracket um, here. Ah, okay, thank you. Um, so this is, you can imagine that this type has one element if X equals infinity and uh, it is empty when X is different from infinity. Yeah. Great, so when it is empty, you get only one function. And so you get one copy of each uh, finite natural number. But uh, when it is the one point type, you get, that this happens when X is infinity, you get two functions and these two functions are the two points at infinity. Yeah, and this space is going to be useful as a counter example to some things later. So let's write in type theory the, the problem I formulated in the first slide. So we, so for any given function from X into the booleans, X is an arbitrary type. Um, um, we can either find a root of, of the function or we can tell that there is no root, okay? And this is actually, this is, if you could do this for all types X, this is, 
this is stronger than excluded middle, and they say it's actually global choice. So if this cannot hold um, for all types, but uh, I'm going to call the types for which this hold holds compact. But actually, I'm not sure what to call these types because we we saw that um, there are three interpretations of this um, of this statement: a computational, a logical, and a topological one. So um, I'm having a bias in the topological interpretation when I define this, but perhaps it would be better to have a terminology which is not biased toward computation or, or topology. Um, but for this talk, I'm going to call them compact. And they will be compact, at least uh, in, in, in a lot of examples. Um, so, what is global choice? So global choice says that for any given type in, in some universe, um, if X is non-empty, then you can pick a point of X. Yeah, and uh, all types are compact if and only if global choice holds. Now the global choice is, of course, uh, is stronger than choice. Choice is consistent with univalence. For example, Vivovsky's model of simplicial sets validates choice, but it doesn't validate global choice. So no model at all can validate global of homotopy type theory can validate global choice because global choice contradicts uh, univalence. And the intuition is that uh, you cannot perform a choice. You cannot choose a point of X in a way that is invariant under automorphisms of X. So if you permute X, then you will um, this is not going to be preserved by the choice function. Uh, there is a proof in the hot book, but the, the idea is, is this. But, okay, so although not all types can be compact, there are plenty of compact types, and this is what I want to show you. And the ones I can construct, they actually are well ordered. So let's, I'm not sure whether I'm going to, I'm probably going to skip this slide, but people later can ask questions about that. So this is slides I'm skipping is the definition of well order. For the moment, you can keep this as a, um, an intuitive notion similar to the one from set theory that presumably most of you or all of you will know. So now let's look at functions into the booleans. Now the in, turn, in the type theory, they, they classify complemented subtypes of, um, of X. Now, in the topological topos, what they do is they classify closed and open sets. So a function into, into the booleans is a clopen. Yeah, so if you, if you go back to the, to the previous slide here, so this means you can, given any clopen set, you can choose a point of a clopen or say that there isn't any point. And if you look at realizability toposes, they, they classify decidable subobjects with decidability in the sense of uh, computability theory. So now, if you look at the definition of compactness, it is not good unless there are plenty of maps from X into the Booleans. For example, suppose, look at the topological topos. So, and choose the real numbers, which are a sequential space. And so they are in the topological space, in the topological topos. And so this is a clopen of the real numbers. So, but there are only two clopens uh, in the real numbers because uh, they form a connected space. And so you can easily check this. You just take the point zero, check whether P of zero is uh, zero or not, and then you're done. Because if it's zero, you have found one, and uh, if it's not zero, then um, it, because it's constant, it has to be one everywhere. And uh, so the real numbers are compact in a trivial way and they shouldn't be compact, yeah? So what you need is to, you need the space to have plenty of clopen sets. And so in the type theory, we're going to call the type X to be totally separated. If for any given two points of X, um, X and Y, if any two functions into the Booleans uh, cannot distinguish X and Y, then X 
equals to y. So this is a little bit like Leibniz principle. If you have heard of it, things are equal when they have the same properties, but is a, is a Boolean, is a, here we're talking about Boolean valued properties. So it's a Boolean Leibniz principle. Now, if you look at the topological topos, then what this notion gives you is the usual notion of total separatedness in topology, which uh, is usually formulated as saying the clopens separate the points. Yeah, so you have enough clopen sets. So my notion of compactness is only going to be a good one uh, for totally separated types. Yeah, so we're going to consider only compact, totally separated um, functions. Is there any question so far about this? Okay, so here are some facts. So now uh, if you look in the type theory, you can prove that any totally separated type is a set, which means that the identity types, so the quality types are propositions. So they have at most one element. And they form an exponential ideal. And also they are closed under plus times retracts. And uh, they include um, the natural numbers, the one point compactification, and all the discrete types. Yeah, the type. So discrete types are the type with decidable equality. But they're not close on their sigma. So here's an example. It's the example we saw before. Um, so we look at uh, the subtype of the one compact one point compactification with the well, it's not a subtype. We look at the explosion of the point at infinity into two copies. And now this is totally separated at infinity. This type is totally separated because um, the totally separated spaces form an exponential ideal and two, the booleans is totally separated. But this space is not totally separated. And um, in particular, you cannot separate the, I mean, it, that's because you cannot separate the two points at infinity that we saw before in the picture we had, yeah? And this you can prove actually in, in some sense uh, in the type theory without looking at the models, but uh, looking at the models uh, is, uh, is interesting to see what is happening, yeah? So we are going to be then looking at compact, totally separated types, yeah? Um, but in the, when we say spaces, compact, totally separated, is also known as stone spaces. Yeah, so we are looking to we could call these stone types if we wanted. But um, uh, Martin, can I can I stop you there yeah. a minute? Do you have the logical reading of that? Of what? Of the fact that this that segment does not preserve this uh, totally separated property, right? Because wow. you know you 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 have as you say. In blue, you say that that n infinity is totally separated. The the thing inside the, the the sum is totally separated, but but the whole thing is not. Yeah. Okay. So um, what happens is that in some models, this um, this is totally separated, like in the model of classical sets. Um, in the topological topos, it's not totally separated. Now, what I can prove in the, um, in the internally in the type theory is that um, if we assume that this is totally separated, then from this assumption, you can deduce a so-called uh, constructive taboo. We are going to see examples of constructive taboos later. Um, so this implies something like LPO or WLPO and so on. But I prefer to talk about this in a minute. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, but in the models, in the topological topos, it is not totally separated. And, um, and in the classical set, it is, which means it is independent. You cannot prove or disprove it, but you can prove that the total separatedness Improve, uh, implies a constructive taboo. Um, so another thing about totally separated, 
is define the simple types to be the smallest collection of types which have zero, one, and n, and is closed under times, plus, and function space. And this, this, the simple types are all totally separated. Yeah. And um, now what justifies my terminology in the talk is the following fact, number five. So a subtype of a simple type in the sense of uh, the definition number four is compact in the, in the sense I defined if and only if it is compact in the topological sense. Okay, so this should justify my definition. And moreover, in this case, the inclusion um, um, of the subtype into the ambient type is a section. And so uh, it so is a retract of a totally separated type. And so it is also to totally separated. Okay, so, um, so now we come to the taboos that um, I was talking about. So here's a counter example. So the set of natural number fails to be compact, but actually you cannot prove again that it is or that it isn't because uh, in some models it is and in some models it, it is not. So in topological models, um, um, the compactness fails because then the process of picking a root of a function is not continuous. In the realizability topos, it fails because picking a root is not computable, but uh, it's true by the axiom of choice in sets. Okay. Now, the assumption that x that n, the natural numbers, is compact is called by Bishop the limited principle of omniscience. Uh, of course, only somebody called Bishop could come up with such a name, but. Uh, um, uh, and this uh, is, a, is a called a taboo of constructive mathematics, so it's something that is not provable, and in Bishop mathematics is not provable or disprovable, but is, but is not considered to be a constructive principle, and you can see why uh, here. Um, so here, the, the, the simplest example, actually, we have already seen it, the simplest infinite example of a, of, a of a type that you can prove in the type theory to be compact uh, is an infinity. And um, which I defined before, so the decreasing binary sequences. And um, in fact, I proved that uh, you can you can define the searchability or the compactness of this type here in a system much weaker than than um, than type theory than dependent type theory. You can do this actually in Gödel system T. Um, so Gödel system T is a language for the simple types I mentioned before. And I'm going to give you another full proof because it will take some time, but I'm going to give you a proof uh, sketch. So how, if you have a function P and you want to find the root, and uh, we are going to def define this it by the follow following formula. So you're going to define a sequence beta of booleans. Um, and the nth position, you just take the minimums of the values of the function that you started with. And actually, actually, this is not only a formula for the root, if, if the root exists, but it's a formula for the infimum of the set of roots. So if there is no root, you're taking the infimum of, a, of the empty set, and so you get the point at infinity, if you consider the natural, the natural way to order an infinity. So, okay, so now you have the sequence, and what you do is you check whether um, it is a root or not. If, it is, if it's a root, then you have found it. And then it, you can prove, and this is what I'm, I'm omitting here, that uh, if this is not a root, then nothing can be a root. Yeah? And that's relatively easy to see using classical logic. It's a little bit trickier to do, prove it constructively, but uh, it can be done. 
And in fact, um, uh, yeah, so I, in fact, implemented this in, in ACDA. I mean, the most things that I did here, except the, when I discussed the models, I actually implemented in ACDA. And, and the reason I implemented this in ACDA is not because I wanted to be sure it is correct, but uh, because ACDA has a computational interpretation. And so if you formalize this in ACDA, you can actually run this and do and check, you know, find roots of functions defined in infinite sets, which is fun. Um, Okay. I'm going to probably skip some of these consequences so that I don't know how much. Yeah, I'll probably skip it to be on the safe sides. Uh, some people actually came up with applications of the compactness of N infinity. So Pradik and Brown, they, they proved that uh, Cantor Bernstein implies include, excluded middle using the fact that um, N infinity is compact. And this is nice. So before it was known that uh, Cantor, Cantor Bernstein implies um, uh, something which is a constructive taboo, but actually they proved that they improved, they actually um, implies excluded middle. And so, but uh, because excluded middle is enough to prove it, so Cantor Bernstein is actually equivalent to excluded middle. Uh, the second one is more amusing. So the, there is a widely circulated manuscript by Tate about the continuity or computability of, the, of a certain fun functional. And that this inspired uh, several generations of people in computability theory. Um, but actually, there was a small gap that uh, Doug Norman found. Uh, this manuscript is from 1958. Uh, um, but uh, recently, Doug Norman found a gap, and, uh, and um, they were able to, to fill the gap using the fact that uh, you can search an infinity in system T. So I was very pleased that uh, somebody used this to do something useful, because I don't do anything useful with what I'm telling you. I'm just showing that these things exist. Um, so here are some examples. So we have seen these simple examples before. The compact types are closed and their coproducts and, and binary Cartesian products. I call this, uh, like in some books, the baby Tikhonov theorem. Um, they are closed under sigma. So if you have that uh, X is compact and each of the elements of the family indexed by X is also compact, then the sum is compact. But this doesn't actually, is not provable for, um, for pi, for Cartesian products. That will be very interesting if it were, because it will be the real Tikhonov theorem, but actually, for the real Tikhonov theorem, this type here has to be discrete because if you look at the topological topos, when X is not discrete and you have a pi here, this cannot be compact because it's not going to be the topological product, but it's going to be some sort of function space instead, some kind of, uh, and then if X is not discrete, this cannot be compact. But um, we'll see in the next slide uh, in more detail, you can prove um, a particular case of the Tikhonov, which I'm actually going to need it. So I didn't prove this because I fancy proving the strange theorems, but uh, it was needed in a construction that, um, that I'll show you later. So I call this micro Tikhonov. So in micro Tikhonov, you look at when the product is compact. And uh, so it will be if the following happens, this set X, has at most one element. So it's a subterminal uh, or a proposition. And each element of the family is compact. So this says, if you have a family of compact sets in which every element of the family is compact, and there is at most one element in the family, then the product is compact. Yeah, this is surprisingly difficult. Well, maybe you can find an, a simpler, simple proof, but for me, it was surprisingly difficult to prove this uh, micro Tikhonov theorem. 
I'll show you later why it is useful. Now, let's discuss what I mentioned quickly. So we had baby Tikhonov and micro Tikhonov. So can we have arbitrary Tikhonov? So no, and in particular, if you had arbitrary Tikhonov, you would get the compactness of the Cantor space provable um, in the type theory, but unfortunately is not provable in the type theory. And the way to see this is to consider two models. I show you three here, but two are enough. Now, this is compact in the, in the topological topos, not only in the topological sense, but in the sense of my definition of compactness, because they agree uh, for this kind of types. But it's false if you consider um, the effective topos. Um, if you happen to know about in computability theory, there are some gadgets called Clini trees. And in order to prove that uh, the Cantor space is not compact, um, we use the Clini tree. Uh, it is interesting because the Clini tree was introduced um, by Clini precisely for this kind of thing, not, not for my notion of compactness because he was not looking at that, but uh, he was uh, looking at interpretations of constructive analysis and whether um, some of the axioms by Brouwer are necessarily validated or not by realizability models. And he came up with a Clini tree to prove that they, they are not. Um, but then he came up with another notion of realizability. So which is known as realizability over K2, which actually does re realize um, the Brouwerian axioms. And uh, this was uh, studied in a book by Clini and Vesley. And that's why people call this the Clini Vesley topos. Although of course, at that time they didn't use topos theory, but, um, but it's the same expressed in a different language. Now, it's very interesting that these topos are very different because this topos here is a Grothendieck topos. And this topos is an elementary topos, it's not a Grothendieck topos, it's a realizability topos. But if you look at the simple types, so remember the simple types are the types if you start with the natural numbers, maybe the booleans if you like, and then close under function types, and maybe under binary products if you want, and binary coproducts, it doesn't matter. So the, if you look at the category on the simple objects, these categories are equivalent, um, which is very interesting. And not only are they equivalent, but uh, these categories are equivalent to something else that Clini and Kreisel introduced in the, in the 1950s, which were the Clini, nowadays they're called the Clini Kreisel continuous functionals, or sometimes they're called just the, the continuous functionals in, um, in the computability theory literature. And they arise as, sub as full subcategories of either the topological topos or, um, or, the, or the realizability over K2, but also many other toposes. And this is amazing. So John Longley from Edinburgh uh, wrote a, a big paper explaining why it is the case that this type structure arises uh, in so many different mathematical guises. Okay, so this was a kind of a digression, but not so much of a digression because it means that uh, when you're talking about realizability over K2, essentially you are doing topology. Okay, so we have constructed uh, this, um, this kind of, um, of compact sets in the previous slides. I'm sorry, I did, didn't show you how to actually prove that they are compact. I only show that how to prove that N infinity is compact but uh, there isn't enough time in one hour. Um, I particularly like the proof of three, it's nice. Um, you can actually well order these sets. Um, so here you take just a natural order. Here you just put the two orders, one on top of the other um, for, for the binary Cartesian product and the sum, you just take the lexicographical order on pairs, and then you can prove that uh, these things are uh, well-ordered. 
but you don't get very high ordinals when you do this. Um, so what we want to do next is to construct more compact types. And, and we are going to measure more using ordinals. So, and in order to do this, I'm going to use a, um, this tool here. So I'm going to start with a family of types in some type universe. And um, I'm going to extend the, the index set with an embedding. And I'm going to see if I can come up with some extension of the family A, an extension B of the family A. Uh, there are many cases I'm interested in, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to look at only this particular case, which is if you have the natural numbers that is um, embedded into, into the one point compactification, um, we want to extend the family. Okay, so what is the problem here? So the problem is that constructively, you cannot check whether an element of an infinity is infinity or not. But uh, if we want to reason in such a way that our reasoning is valid in any topos, um, we cannot do this, yeah? We need, we need to be constructive. So as you know, so we are going to see how we can do that. And what we want is that uh, if each of the elements of the family uh, were compact, then also each of the elements of the extended family are compact as well. Because then by three, so let's see what is three. Because by this, so that's uh, the closure and the sigma. Then um, if uh, y is also compact, like in this example here, so each element in the family is compact, but now y is also compact, we can take this sum and this will be compact too. Yeah, so if we could do that. So let's see if we can do that. And, um, and actually when I was working on this, I paused like for maybe one year, six months or some amount of time to look at this problem only. So this is an injectivity problem, yeah? So in, in what happens is that the universe of types or any universe of types is injective, so over embeddings. And for the purposes of this talk and for the purposes of homotopy type theory, we will say that J is an embedding if the fibers of each point of Y um, are sub-singletons or elements, uh, so the types with at most one element. So whenever you pull back a point of Y, then you get it, um, at most one thing in X. And uh, it turns out that there are two ways of extending this and they are not very difficult. There is a, there is a left can extension and there is a right can extension and they work in the same way, but uh, you use pi or sigma. So let's look at the one with pi. So um, what we do is to define B, you start with a Y. So you want to define B of Y, you start with a Y, pull it back. So you get this type here, and then, which may be empty, but uh, it has at most one element. And then you do the product over this family of all this set, okay? And it is here that micro Tikhonov is useful because this is a micro Tikhonov applied only for type for index sets with at most one element. And uh, so if each of the AXs is compact, then by micro Tikhonov, the BY is compact, which is exactly what I wanted. I wanted if I have a family of compact types, then the extension is also a family of compact types. Sorry, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but what is x colon g minus one of y? Uh, okay, so let's write this in full, it. okay? So let's write this in full. So the f, the, um, this is the fiber of y, which is the axis such that- right, I don't uh, think we're, we're seeing your screen right now. Oh, I see yeah. it, it's up there, sorry. Yeah, I do see yeah it's up there. Yep. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I didn't tell you what I was writing. I'm writing on the top left. So, um, 
So this is the fiber, yeah? So here is a slight abuse of notation. Uh, the fiber consists of two things. So if I want to not to abuse notation, I can say such that X blank is in this type, yeah? So let's fix the slide here. Great, here thanks. As well. thanks, thanks. Sorry for the abuse of notation. I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so um, yep, so that's the idea. And you can check, uh, it's not hard to check that uh, this is indeed an extension. It is only an extension up to equivalence. Um, if you want to make it an extension up to equality, you can use in univalence, but uh, this is not important. So we don't need to use univalence. Um, it's enough that it's an extension up to equivalence. And Martin, is that why you kind of created this notion of compactness? Because then you could you could prove this this baby the baby the micro chicken off and and get this. So, okay. so I started looking at this compactness a, a long time ago. So probably my first paper was in two thousand and six, and they had uh, some other writings about that uh, before. I was at that time. I was not looking. I was not working in homotopy type theory. I was not um, um, uh, looking at toposis. I was just working um, with the programming language PCF introduced by Dennis Scott and the domain model. And then I wanted to understand which infinite types you could exhaustively search in this programming language. And it turned out that um, in the case of PCF, actually the Cantor space is uh, searchable in PCF. So I could prove that um, um, a type in PCF was searchable if and only if it is a continuous image of the Cantor, sorry, not continuous, if it's a computable image of the Cantor space. And so in, in that setting, so then I, I realized that um, that uh, being able to computationally search a space is amounted in some sense to the space being compact, yeah? And now what, um, right. what I'm doing here is sort of the same, but I'm doing the two differences. One is that instead of PCF, I'm using homotopy type theory. And also the models are richer because instead of considering only the domains model, I consider any topos and we can see what happens uh, in the different topos, in particular the um, the topological topos, um, where, as is justified before, if you look at the simple types, then the notion actually coincides with compactness. Does Thank that you for sort the of the other? ideas. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so this is sort of, sort of thing that has been going on for many years. Um, Um, yeah, so the summary of what we saw before is, yes, you can extend the family. And moreover, if the set AX is compact for every X, then also the same thing happens for the set BY is also compact for every Y. And additionally, if, if Y happens to be compact, like in this example here, then when you do the sum, um, then this is also compact. So notice what happens when you look at this particular case of interest here, what is B of infinity? So you look at the fiber of infinity, it's empty. So you do the product of the empty set here, uh, sorry, a product of things indexed by the empty set, then that uh, is uh, the terminal type, yeah. Um, that's what happens in this case, but uh, we don't really need to know that, but just for curiosity. So that gives you a way of building compact sets. Um, so what I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to look at the situation here. And then, so we add the point at infinity to N and then we do this sum. And so looking at the previous slide, we have one of the summons is the terminal type here. But this, oops, I'm thinking I, I went 
the other way around, sorry about that. So the one point type is going to be here as an example, but it's going to be there as a point at infinity. And we can instead add it as an isolated point. It will really be actually, if you look at the topological topos, it will really be an isolated point. And I'm going to, uh, for this purpose of the following slides, I'm going to, to call the isolated addition of one extra point with a subscript one, and I'm going to, to use the addition of a point at infinity with a superscript one. And uh, so now you can easily, I'm not going to give you a definition, but there is an easy function here that embeds um, the left type into the right type. And, um, and classically, if you use classical logic, this is actually a bijection because the point at infinity can be detached, if you like, by using excluded middle, you can detach the point. But constructively, it's something very counterintuitive happens. Uh, I mean, I'm used to it, so it's not counterintuitive to me, but uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an embedding, which is not a bijection in some models, but, but uh, you can always prove that um, the image of this embedding has empty complement, yeah? So you can show that um, there is nothing outside the, the image, but you cannot show that this is a bijection. I'm actually, if I have time, I'm going to give you a more concrete example illustrating this. I'm sorry, you, you, uh, uh, I, I, I've been asking you too many questions, but it's already 10.52, okay? <laughs> just, just so okay, you Okay, let me show you the main slide if I, if I manage to get. Um, okay, so now what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to uh, define inductively ordinal expressions. So I'm going to have an expression for the ordinal one, and then I'm going to have a constructor for adding two ordinal expressions, multiplying, and then summing up a sequence of expressions. Yeah, so if you have seen something like Brouwer ordinals before, this is similar to the so-called Brouwer ordinals. So it's an inductively, so these are countably branching trees. Well, sometimes they branch binarily, like in Adam one and the leaves uh, are here. So this is a type of countably branching trees. And now you can interpret, you can give an interpretation of each of these trees as ordinals in two ways. The, the ways are actually the same. The only thing that changes is where we put the subscript in, in sigma according to what I told you before. So you interpret one as one, addition as addition of ordinals, mole as multiplication of ordinals, and this as sum of ordinals, but with an extra isolated point, as I discussed before. And here you do the same, but the sum now is with a, an extra point, but the extra point is at infinity, is not isolated. It's like, the, it's like the point in the one point compactification. And the main results of today are the following. Um, you can look at this, each of these ordinals um, with the, the isolated and the limit version. Now, each of the ordinals in the isolated uh, interpretation, they are discrete. So this means in terms of the type theory, this means that they have decidable equality, but in terms of the topological topos, it means they're discrete in the topological sense. And uh, moreover, they are retracts of the natural numbers and in particular, they're countable ordinals, um, but they are not compact, not compact in the topological topos. And if you want to say this internally uh, in the type theory, you say it's not compact unless WLPO holds. And now these ones, the ones by interpreting the sum with a point at infinity, they're all compact. Now, and this is very difficult to prove, very long, um, they are all retracts of the Cantor space. And the reason I went to do this proof is to actually conclude that they are totally separated. Because as I told you before, a compact type, which is not totally separated is not very useful. 
And this type can only be useful if you have enough functions into the booleans. And so that's why I prove that is a retract of the counter space. But they are not countable unless you have LPO. And also they are not discrete unless you have WLPO. And uh, so you have an order preserved and, and reflecting embedding of the ordinals of the first kind into the ordinals of the second kind, whose image has an empty complement. And this, is a, this embedding cannot be a bijection. Uh, if you look at uh, in models, um, in the topological topos, um, the, yeah, so this has a discrete topology and this has a compact Hausdorff topology. So this is a stone space in the topological topos, and this is a, a discrete space. And so even though this, this is a one-to-one -one map, of course, it cannot have a continuous inverse, yeah? And in the case of computability, the map doesn't have a computable inverse if you look at the effective topos. Yeah, and I guess um, we're almost finished actually, but I want to illustrate just in case you're lost um, because this is too general, let's do one particular case, um, which is uh, this example. So this is certainly discrete. If you add uh, one point to a discrete space, you get a discrete space and it's countable. And now this one is compact. Of course, it's not discrete. Um, well, you say, well, but it is countable. Well, not constructively. Yeah, constructively, you cannot prove it's countable. And um, so let's see um, what it means to say that the image has empty complement of this map. So this is this following constructive fact, which says there is no decreasing sequence order than the two examples that uh, we have seen. And, uh, and bijection is stronger than this because bijection says every increase in sequence has to be either this or that. Now, a classical mathematician cannot see the difference between these two statements, of course, but uh, they are different yeah? um, in the generality we're talking about. So thank you very much. I'm done. Well, thank you so much, Martin. <laughs> I, 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 this very uh, interesting tour of things. I think everyone is clapping, kind of some virtually like Koji, and, and but thanks a lot. Um, thank you. Can we have questions? Um, I don't see yet questions. And I, I, mean, I have three or four of my own, but I'd rather let other people go first. Uh, yeah. And Martin, the other thing is normally people, um, we stop the recording after two or three questions and then, um, and then if you can stay for a little longer, we, you know. Yeah, that's fine, yeah, that's fine. Thank you. But David has a question, Valeria, he has his hand up. Oh, great, Thank, thanks, Jim. Go uh, ahead, David, okay. please. Okay. Um, well, thanks, Martin. That was a wonderful talk. I really lo loved the proof of uh, on page 16 of the compactness. Um, but I was wondering, do you have a, a characterization of those types for which over which um, pi does retain compactness? I think I understood that you said discrete types and subterminal types. But no, I, I mean, in the models, uh, no, OK. So we have, yeah, I have to be careful because I, I stated some facts that true in the models. And then I stated some facts that are provable in the type theory. Now in the model for a pi um, to be compact, the index set has to be a discrete space because um, usually um, if you can use these um, theorems uh, as, as, scholar, as Colley or Zeller type theorems. Uh, so in general, function spaces have a very small supply of compact sets and so they are hardly ever even they are not even locally i mean you get that every uh, compact set has empty interior and things like that so you don't get you don't get uh, function spaces to be compact unless the exponent is discrete yeah, yeah so, so that's what terminal, that's subterminal the models subterminal yeah. does not work there you're saying subterminal sub sub singleton sorry does not work there 
No, sub singletons should work in the model because they work in the type theory. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Then I'm. Yeah, I was wondering what are the in the. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm wondering okay. if some, some set must contain subterminals and uh, also discretes, at least for the topological topos. I'm wondering about that whole set. Um, have I uh, gone too far back? Yeah. Maybe there we go. No, okay, sorry. I'm just wasting I thought, time. I thought maybe taken off. Oh, here. Here we are. Yeah, so if you combine if you combine baby taken off with micro taken off, yeah. then yeah. you get that uh, the index set can be any subtype of a, of a type of a finite type uh, with n elements. Okay. Yeah. Any subtype of a, of a finite type. Yes. Great. Uh, that's what you can prove in the theory, yeah? And the reason why you cannot prove it for infinite discrete, um, uh, because it's for infinite x discrete is true in the topological topos, but you cannot prove it in the type theory because you can build a counterexample in the effective topos using the Kleene tree. Okay, so that's the, the way to see that. Uh, so it's true in the topological topos, but not provable in the type theory. Great, thanks a lot. Cool. Uh, I, 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 can, I, can I show all my ignorance and say that I do not know what is this, uh, the topological topos? I mean, who, who came up with that, Martin? Uh, sorry, I should have mentioned that um, people should give sources in talks. Uh, it's Peter Johnston, I think it was in 1979. Oh, yeah. Right. And similarly, I, I wanted to know about sequential topological spaces. Yes. Yes. Uh, and I kind of, um, I wanted to, you know, you, you kind of, you mentioned John Longley's work and his book and things but you know i felt that there was a missing end of you know why did he do that and and how uh what is the so he you're saying that he was doing it things just with um uh ghetto's system t of types right simple types and i presume yeah so, yeah. Types if you interpret, yeah, so if you interpret ghetto system t you are only in this uh, tiny subset of the topological topos yes Right, and, and, and um, most of the things I did, not everything, but a lot of the things I did live in this, in the limit of a Kuratowski limit spaces. But of course, at some point I use universes to extend families and so on. And then, uh, then you actually probably need to go beyond one toposis and go to infinity toposis to talk about properly about this. But right. I don't understand the question. Yeah. So what well, was Johnson's motivation? Uh, I, I was actually, I, I mean, no, the question, the real question is as follows. The NLAB has a page called um, Appropriate Spaces, uh, Topological Spaces or something like that, where kind of the, the folk wisdom that topological spaces are, are difficult to deal with because they are not kind of Cartesian closed by and large is, is described, right? And I kind of wondered uh, how that squares with, with this idea, I mean, since I did not know about Johnson 79 topological topos and, and okay, so topos. yeah, so if you if you read uh, Peter Johnston's paper, um, the, he begins by uh, considering the question that uh, somebody asked. Now I forget the name of the person. Whether there are there are toposes whose objects are topological spaces, and then that person concludes that no, there aren't, and then. Johnston goes on to say, okay, but I can embed a large category of topological spaces and the sequential topological spaces into a topos. Yeah, so not, not everything here is a space because the Kuratowski limit spaces are not topological spaces in general. Okay, so they, they, are, they are limit spaces and they are not topological spaces. And, uh, and when you get here, it's even worse because this, so these things are here are concrete. They have an underlying set, if you like, but these things don't even have an underlying set. Um, 
Um, right. Yeah. Excellent. But it was also, um, Peter was addressing some questions by Lovere uh, about um, embedding spaces into topposition. So if you, maybe you should read at least the introduction of the paper <laughs> where he explains why he's doing that. But there, there are more motivations. Fantastic. Uh, apparently, I mean, uh, uh, we think that maybe Andreas Blas has a question. Uh, no, I yes. don't have a question, but I do have, let me just add a little bit to the answer to your question, um, just to make sure this connects up with what you were quoting from the NLAB about convenient categories. I am. They, they want to be able to exponentiate whatever spaces they have. And I think part of Peter's point in inventing this topological topos is to say, well, that's a mess if you try to do it with all topological spaces, but the topological spaces people usually work with tend to be sequential ones. They fit inside this topos. And of course the topos is Cartesian closed, so you can exponentiate all you want. Um, so in that sense, he's saying, okay, this convenience categories, yeah, that's fine. But here's an extremely convenient category, a topos, where, where all these things exist. It, yeah. and, and you still have most of the spaces you want. Yes, that's, that's right. And we can say, we can add one more thing to what you just said. So the category of topological spaces is not Cartesian closed. However, the category of sequential topological spaces is Cartesian closed. And the embedding, which amounts to essentially Yoneda, actually preserves the Cartesian closed structure. So it's not, you don't get new exponentials, you get the exponentials that existed before. Right, but then, then I wanted to know what happens with the John Longley story. How does it fit into that? Uh, okay, so the John Longley story is that, um, so already Kliny and Kreisel, when they introduced the continuous functionals, they did in very different ways. So there were two ways. So Kliny's way was to work with, um, with a combinatory algebra whose underlying set is the bare space. And so you define an untyped application on the elements of the bare space. And, uh, and then he used this to define the, the, the continuous functionals, whereas Kreisel used something which is much closer to domain theory in the sense of Dana Scott. It's not quite the same, but actually Dana Scott says he was inspired in partly by, by this. And, um, and so the, already from the beginning, you had two very different descriptions of the continuous functionals. And then people kept coming up with new definitions of the continuous functionals. And one of them was proved by Martin Highland in, in the early 1970s. He says, okay, so here's a very simple way to do it. We know that the category of compactly generated spaces is Cartesian closed. And um, to get the Kliny Kreisel continuous functionals, just do the following, start with the discrete natural numbers and keep exponentiating in that category, that's all. Uh, so that was one definition. Then uh, Erdo, no, um, Ershoff uh, gave another definition using domain theory and partial equivalence relations. And then people kept giving more and more definitions, um, some topological, some more with computation, and they all turned to be equivalent and very different. And so John, Longley wrote a paper called on the ubiquity of certain type structures in which he tries to tame the, uh, this to, uh, uh, to explain why, why uh, and in several situations you always get the same result. So the same type hierarchy over the natural numbers. Um, it's a paper in mathematical structures and computer science It's a very long paper. John Longley doesn't write many papers, but whenever he writes a paper, it has at least uh, 100 pages. And so this paper was in a special issue. And I was one of the editors and we had to have a second volume of the issue just for John's paper. <laughs> okay, I think that is, there's been a 
wonderful talk. Thanks so much. I, I think we can stop perhaps the, we can clap again and stop the streaming and then we can carry on a little bit. Few mm -hmm. more, one more question later on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.